right, welcome to This Ought to Be Good. This is episode five. I'm here with my guest, Jay Kwan. Thanks for being here today, Jay Kwan. I really appreciate it. No, Thanks for having guy. me. We talked a, a little bit yesterday, just, you know, doing a little check and, uh, you know, it definitely sounds yes. like you're staying busy this season. So I um, wanted to jump right into it, if that's all right with you. Certainly. <clears throat> uh, can you share some insights about your journey, like as a hip hop historian from like your early days of writing online to like your current roles with Rock the Bells and like the National Hip Hop Museum? Certainly. Um, I started online um, as soon as the Internet became popular, right around 95, 96, when we still had dial up and <laughs> we still call it the World Wide Web. So from the very beginning, I was there. And, you know, a brief story, um, you know, the first time I ever got on the Internet was around, I guess, 95 or so at, at University of Richmond. A friend of mine was going to the law school there. And, you know, we didn't have and everybody didn't have the Internet at home yet. This is right around the time when AOL started to send out the floppy disk, trying to get people to come on to this uh, information superhighway, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And we were there uh, surfing the Internet. And um, I looked up the word hip hop. That's the first word, uh, word I ever searched for. And it was definitely no Google. Wasn't even an Ask Jeeves or anything. It might have been excite. Whatever search engine there was, was probably one or two at a time. But like, moral great. of the story. Yeah. Moral of the story is, uh, you know, when I searched hip hop, only two stories came up. There was one on KRS One, and one on Run DMC. That's it in the whole internet. At that moment, I said, I'm going to learn how to build web pages, which we called them at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I got my own domain name. It was jquan.com was the first site I ever had. And I knew that if this thing, if the internet ever took off, this is long before social media is just the internet in its very, very embryonic uh, stages. I said, if it takes off, they're not whoever is running this show because you still didn't know they're not going to cover the foundational artists like the Crash Crew, first generation guys like Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, Cold Crush Brothers, Fantastic Five. So I said, I'm going to create a website that's going to do a little paragraph or so of each of these foundational artists so they won't be forgotten. And little did I know that those artists would reach out to me and different people would reach out to help and offer interviews. So I started out doing that and from there it morphed into after you know i guess a, a decade or so you know um when, once youtube came along people stopped reading um you know long form and short form content in a way and youtube was very popular and, and other sites where you narrate things and have moving pictures so i decided to uh to hop on youtube and do what i call lessons where i take some of those same artists and just narrate um, short stories on them. And that's what really got me recognized was those foundation lessons on YouTube. And that indirectly, or maybe even directly led to me uh, being associated with Rock the Bells and employed uh, by Rock the Bells as a content creator, you know, video, social uh, content creator, writer. And uh, National Hip Hop Museum, they saw me on YouTube. Most of, most of the things that have happened for me in the last, uh, since COVID happened, definitely were a result of my youtube content mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what what inspired you i know you know besides the lack of content out there like what inspired you to delve into like the history of hip-hop and how has your like perspective on the genre like evolved over those years well you know i um i've always been a historian at heart uh, even before hip-hop i've always wanted to know how things work um, even my electronic toys as a kid, I couldn't really keep my electronic toys in good order because I had to take them apart. And like, how, how is this, you know, we came being a seventies child, you know, and, and coming up in the eighties, you know, we had a lot of cool electronic handheld games and games that could talk. And I had to know how does this work? And so I've always kind of had that mind. So I always wanted to know for everything, whether it's my comic books, whatever, how do they animate, you know, how do they do the Saturday morning cartoons? How, you know, when I heard, first heard Scratching in 81 on uh, Adventures on the Wheels of Steel by Grandmaster Flash, mm -hmm. unless you were, you know, from the tri-state area, you didn't know how Scratching was done. You heard it, but right. you didn't know where they're moving the platter. You know, it, that might sound stupid today, but it was never televised. You didn't know, mm -hmm. you just heard the Scratching. So I want to know how things work. So I collected magazines as a kid, any the few magazines that I could get about hip hop culture and what this was and you know how it started. Um, so you know, when I heard the first rap records in '79, um, that totally totally changed my interest for my comic books and the other things that are I think I was eight years old in '79. Yeah, mm -hmm. everything else that a kid 
in his in, in the seventies would be interested in Pee Wee football, comics, whatever. All my interests went to buying these records and trying to find out how these guys, you know, how you how do you rap and all of these things. So, one hundred percent, I've always been a historian. So when the internet became popular. I didn't, nobody knew the internet would, would take over our lives like it has, but I knew I wanted to be in the forefront of just letting people know that, you know, this thing didn't start with Run DMC because that's one thing, um, just co corporate culture, you know, and corporate America in general, when something gets to a certain uh, level, uh, it makes a certain monetary uh, gain, mm -hmm. then that's when they start the history. Okay, it started to make money here, so this is when it started. But I, I knew that there, there was a, a whole, you know, a whole decade previous to those rap records or half a decade at least that that needed to be covered. So mm -hmm. that was my main motivation for it. The way that my my uh, view of hip hop has changed since I first started writing. Um, it, it hasn't changed much other than it's a lot more inclusive now as far as the timeline. When I started out, I was purposely writing about pre pre run DMC, you know, Run DMC kicked open the doors with MTV and then went, went you know, with Rockbox and King of Rock. Then once they did uh, Walk This Way, everybody, you know, and it's tricky, you know, mainstream America had it in their living rooms. And um, like I said, I knew that that would be the starting point that people, that most people started history with. So I started out just talking about the pre-Run DMC era, but because I've been online more than 20 years, you know, showing this research, displaying this research, I had to expand the timeline and go into, you know, the the mid 80s and the drum machine era and the sampling era and, you know, the Juice Crew and Eric B and Rock Kim, you know, and I'm, I'm slowly, you know, as I cover as I feel like I've covered a certain era or genre or, or, or timeline piece of the timeline, I'll move up a little bit. And, you know, people keep saying, when are you going to do something on, you know, on, on you know, Tribe Called Quest? And, you know, I've written about those people, but I haven't spent a lot of time there because there's so much previous to them that mm -hmm. I haven't talked about. And it's all very much interconnected, you know. So uh, that's that's awesome. basically it. I was watching an interview. Uh, I think it was uh, one of the guys in Onyx. I can't remember which. Okay. Uh, and he said that I think Dada Rock was like the reason he first got on the mic at like Park Jams. Right. And I was like, wait, <laughs> that Dada Rock? So I yeah. saw your interview with him. I got to read that one. But um, one thing I want to yes. go back to, you, you talked about people having less interest in maybe reading shorter form, long form content. I feel like, <clears throat> so picture tells a thousand words. So like how much does a video tell? Like I, I, I really like the video interviews because you can kind of see the person and their like facial expressions and just, you know, you get a bit more, I feel like out of that than, than, than just reading it on a page. I had a um, teacher who used to hate like when people would use quotes from songs and stuff because it was all out of context, you know, so it's yes. like having a bit more context. Like I, I really like that. Um, it connects you a little bit more to the story. Mm -hmm. or, or the person and their their story their history yeah um when i started djing like i didn't really understand how scratching worked either like i i had belt drive turntables at first and i was like why does the needle keep jumping so i put you know like a penny or a dime or a nickel you know on the tone arm head you know like trying to get it to like stay in place and i was just like I don't, I don't understand like what i'm doing wrong like <laughs> it took a while to understand okay you have to have <laughs> technique 1200s because like everything else was just like not as strong like belt you know the belt drives just couldn't hang with the direct um so i watched your interview with uh is it dr derek coyon yes and he basically asked you this question which i was going to ask you uh your website the foundation featured uh in-depth interviews with hip-hop pioneers and i was curious what have been some of your most memorable interviews and why and you mentioned flash and melly mel and just ice so maybe instead i'll ask um are there any any interviewers that you follow, like, or watch, or recommend? Like people that you look at their interviews and like, I like you know the questions they ask or their style of interviewing. Um, I'll tell you uh, a good writer is uh, actually an associate of mine, um, Mark Skills. He, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, he writes. He he's written mainly for Wax Poetics. He's written for other for Medium and other other. Uh, of outlets, but I, I love what he does as a writer. You know, I, I write, but I consider myself more of a historian. My, uh, I, I'm really concentrating more on the year something happened, the context before it happened, or why it happened, what happened after, who were the players. My thing is always, I want to show you something 
or tell you something that you didn't know before you watched me talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. That's what I take pride in. So I'm a, I'm certainly a writer, but more of a historian. You know, I, I prefer the historical parts of it. Mark Skills, I think he's an excellent writer. A lot of times when he writes something, I can visualize what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Troy Smith, uh, who you, he used to rock with me in the very early days. In fact, he was responsible for connecting me to some of my... When I first built my website and people started coming to support it, uh, Troy Smith, he's from the Grant Projects in Harlem. He's a tape collector, hundreds of tapes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the hip hop tapes of the Cold Crush and Fantastic Foursome Season, guys like that. He um, he used to write with me back in the days, partner of mine, still a good friend. And I believe that he, uh, he also has a very interesting uh, interview style. As far as more popular, I, mean, I watch Drink Champs and, and, and things like that. I, I, you know, it's funny, like when you do something and somebody else does it, it's not that you see them as competition, but you don't always necessarily get very deeply involved into it unless you're, you know, uh, preparing whatever you do mm-hmm. to try to improve it or, or whatever the case is. So, you know, I don't watch a lot of people who do exactly what I do. Um, not not that much. You know, I, I enjoy drink champs, not necessarily for the information. It's very entertaining. I thought it was a very good idea. Right. But um, I can't think right offhand. You know, a lot of times I'm so busy writing and researching. I don't really have a chance to look at a lot of other people's uh, stuff. I look at a lot of documentaries on some mm-hmm. of everything because I'm very mm-hmm. interested in documentaries. So I'm trying to see how people shoot things, how they question things, how they put their B-roll in. So I'm really a documentary head these days on, on all subjects, music and everything. What are what are some ones that you recommend? I, I know, you know, Star Wars is a favorite of mine and and you obviously love it too with your interviews with Charlie Ahern and stuff. So are there any other Star Wars? Star Wars was great, but um I like Freshest again, Kids. I, I like that one a lot too. You say the Freshest Kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great one. I got that I got that one as soon as it came out. I remember I remember um remember that, right? Early two thousands. That's that's a great one. But I'm getting into a lot of documentaries that that aren't necessarily hip hop really. You know, as much as I love hip hop, my love for hip hop comes directly for the fact that I like I love funk and R and B. And then once the MTV era hit, you know, I, I love every genre of music because I grew up with Coke Escovito and the Temptations and um the Eagles, you know, some of everything in my household. So mm-hmm. like the Motown documentary on the Funk Brothers is excellent. The yeah. documentary on um on James yeah. Brown drummers, um Jabo uh Jabo Starks and um and uh, I, I I know I'm not gonna forget the funky drummer's name, um Class Stubblefield. Yeah, Class you know, Stubblefield. excellent mm-hmm. documentary. And two nights ago I spent three hours watching the first three episodes of the Stax documentary which is probably the best music documentary I've seen in, in my entire, you know, time ever, you know. Um, and then the next morning I got up and watched the fourth one. It's a four hour mm-hmm. documentary about Stax. But even if you don't like Stax music, you don't know about it, it's just a good documentary in general. Well done, um, well researched, the archival material was excellent. So uh, yeah, I'm really, really, my documentaries and, and short films, I think are, are, you know, are the next, well, clearly are the next wave, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I saw the previews like when they were first advertising the Stacks one and, and watched the trailer. I really liked what I saw. I was excited to, to see Excellent. it. I seen it Highly yet, recommend I, it. Yeah, definitely want to see it. Um, can Highly you tell recommend. us more about uh, the lessons on YouTube and, and how you approach sort of distilling the history of rap into these informative videos? Sure. Well, yeah, the lessons, um, the, the first, I'm trying to think that, Okay, so the first lesson I did was probably uh, the Funky Four or Fearless Four, one of, one of those groups. There was no particular order. I just knew there was a certain, really the order was who I could contact first and, and verify information. But the lessons were really based on my written interviews th- that I had done first. So the first written interview that I ever did on a popular person was probably Van Silk. Van Silk, you know, New York promoter from the early days, affiliated with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, people like that. And, you know, he used to work for uh, for Spring Records, Spring Polydor. So he was one of the first people to contact me once I had done the website. Because, again, there's really nowhere you could go and see material um, or not material, but content, um, you know, that was pretty dependable, you know, good research content from that first era. So Van Silk reached out to me. I did an interview with him. He connected me to Curtis Blow. And it was like a it was like a snowball effect. Curtis Blow connected me to uh, Melly Mel, who you know was one of my you know mentors, idols, 
Mm-hmm. Melly Mel connected me to somebody. So it was, it was really very much like that. And then Troy Smith, like I said, he, he played a very, uh, very integral part in that as well, connecting me with, you know, Grandmaster Cas and people like that. So it, it's the, you know, that's the saying, if you build it, they will come. I built the website and literally everything came to me, the mm-hmm. people and the opportunities to do some of the things that I'm doing now. So as far as the lessons, like I said, once I started to see a, a bit of a lag in um, readership, you know, that was back in the days where you could, you know, on your website, you might have, you would have the little um, counter where you say how many right, people yeah. have visited and uh, stuff like that. You said somebody asked for one at work and I was like, really? Like, it, oh man, that's old school. Counter. <laughs> right. Right. That's old school. So as I saw the numbers declining, I, I, I knew that one of the reasons was, okay, reading is intimidating to some people, you know, um, even even now, if you see some written content on some on certain websites, there'll be almost like a disclaimer at the like right before the um the byline. It'll say 10 minute read, three minute read, you know, because the way everything is so microwave these days and our time is so, you know, on the Internet. If something doesn't grab your attention in the first 10 seconds, you're scrolling to something else because, you know, social media is like that. You're here. You're on Instagram. You're on Facebook. So the fact that they start putting a header there, you know, 10 minute reads, letting you know, like, you know, if you don't have 10 minutes, you might not want to start this. And, you know, as much as I love to read and, 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 um, and write, that was very disheartening to me that, wow, man, you know, people aren't. And then we, what we've seen in the last few months is like, uh, what was it, sports illustrated, uh, so many different uh, outlets for journalism, um, are shutting down uh, or, or definitely, uh, decreasing their, um, their editorial right. output. Mm-hmm. So, so, so yeah, so, so yeah, that, that's where the lesson started. The lesson started from, I guess I started with like the Funky Four, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the Treacherous Three, uh, Pumpkin, you know, underrated producer from that first era. And then I, you know, when things really started taking off, I did a piece on Rock Him. I've always wanted to, exp- I've always wanted to, pe- you know, people will say certain things in hip hop that are accepted, but nobody ever says why. It's a follow the leader type thing, you pardon the pun with Rock Him, but. Mm-hmm. So everybody says Rakim is the greatest. Nobody ever says why, but it's just, you know, accepted that Rakim is the God. He's the greatest. And nobody ever broke down. Well, well, what, how was the, how was the genre before he entered and how, how was it when he left? How did he leave it? What did he bring to it? What, what was his influence? So I did a 25 minute video, mm-hmm. 30 minute video on Rakim. And I never knew what going viral was. I had okay, you know, uh, I had okay viewership. But the next day after I put that video up, my phone kept going off and mm-hmm. it just it wouldn't stop. And like every day, thousands of people were were commenting on this um this Rock Kim video. And it was because I think it was Ambrosia for Heads have shared it on their thing. That was the first thing. And that made my subscribership go up probably, you know, probably five, ten times more than it already was. Mm-hmm. And that's what really so I, you know, I saw that okay, maybe I stayed in the first generation a little too long because we had a Sometimes we can we can assume that what we're very interested in is what everybody else is very interested in. And as interesting as the first generation is, everybody doesn't is not knowledgeable of it. Mm-hmm. So as um, you know, as 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 I started to go more into the late 80s, mid 80s to late 80s to 90s, I started to see the numbers uh, grow. So that's really what happened with the with the lessons. I'm actually more interested in, in before the first wave, like proto rap, like Kington the third, like I want more yes. on him. Yeah. Like yes. the ones who like, you know, were just doing it and they didn't even, you know, there was no hip name called brand of hip hop, right? Like it was just talking just, and I think uh, DJ Hollywood, you know, too, like just kind of, was, they were just doing that. Like it was just part of kind of that, uh, like the roots of it all kind of before no. it like really kind of gelled and turned into a culture and everything, you know? Like, and like you said, there's no, there was no name for it. And also you mentioned earlier, you know, one of the guys from Onyx, you know, sightings, you know, I think Dada Rocky said, that, that's what I found, you know, like if you, know if you were a star or, uh, right. Okay. Sticky fingers or sticky. Sure what, okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you really, as with anything else, if you, if you search this thing back, you know, everybody has a favorite or influence. And if you search it, it's going to go back to the, the founders, you know, uh, rock him says that he, his, his favorites were, um, uh, Melly Mel, Kaz and Kumo D. Um, and you know, that's what rock him says, rock him influenced the whole generation. So he's their favorite. And then those guys, you know, they're somebody's favorite. So when you search it all the way back, it does go back to the very roots of it. And that's what I'm more interested in. But, you know, I, 
I mistakenly just, you know, I think I, again, I think I spent a little too much time in that era, just assuming that everybody loved what I loved. And when, once I saw that I did the Rock Kim video, because you gotta remember too, those first, you know, couple years of rap records, unless it was like Planet Rock, The Message, or Rapper's Delight, most people, even who would call themselves hip hop heads, they weren't going any deeper than that. They weren't necessarily checking for Spoonie G and mm -hmm. the stuff that was on Sound of New York records and, you know, the, the real, real, as underground as all the rap was, there was an underground under that. And most people only knew, like I said, Planet Rock, The Message, Sucker MCs. So, you know, once I came out of that, I won't say come out of it because I'm always there, but once I graduated and moved a little more on the timeline, I started yeah. to see more people embrace what I was doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As the Minister of uh, Information for Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, uh, what responsibilities does your role entail and how do you preserve and share the legacy of like such iconic artists? Well, you know, that's a uh, that's a very unofficial title that I didn't give myself. I think Dynamite, who was their road manager and a member of the group once they had the factions uh, split up. Um, but Dynamite is, you know, he, he's very, very much uh, affiliated with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. He called me that one time as, you know, he might have been joking. I don't know. But what it was was. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that group. You know, as a kid, I had that, you know, once their record covers started to bear their faces, because you yeah, remember those first handfuls of, of 12 inches, you just saw the record company logo. Mm -hmm. There was no pictures yeah, um, or most of them. The message just because I knew we'd be it, talking about it. <laughs> exactly. Pretty cool. And I had a question actually Mountain about the, the Sweet Mountain Records, too. Like, I, I don't know much about them. Like, I don't know. It's just a subsidiary of Sugar Hill. It's a subsidiary of Sugar Hill. You know, Sylvia would do that. She just started another label. And if you think about it, a Sweet Mountain is a, is a Sugar Hill, which was mm -hmm. pretty cool mm -hmm. play on words. But mm -hmm. yeah, so she released a few records. You know, most, I think the probably the most successful one was uh, Reggie Griffith's Murder Rock, which is like an electro classic. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so so um, yeah, I had their pictures on the wall. And I was a big fan of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five long before they made the message. You know, I, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing I heard about them was Super Rapping and then Freedom and you know, Birthday Party is nasty. All those records, and then of course the message was was the one. But um, always was a fan of the group. So after I you know talked to Flash and I've talked to everybody in the group that's that's still living. You know, before Creole got into you know. The legal ish situation that he's in now, I you know interview him extensively. Me and Melly Mel are good friends. You know, me and him do a college circuit tour. Um, mm -hmm. you, me and Scorpio are cool. You know, I'm cool with everybody in the group. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, interview Flash a couple times. So what started to happen? I have a great archive of like rare pictures of the group because I've been collecting this stuff. Like I said, ever since you know early write on magazines and whatever mm -hmm. magazine even like you know sugar hill records had a one thing sylvia did correctly amongst many things she did correctly she had a good publicist for those guys and a, uh, i forgot who the publicist was it was a publicist out, out in the uk so the uk magazines they would be on the cover of those magazines where in the states they might have a little corner in um in write on magazine or black beat or rock and soul whichever the, the magazine was in the uk they'll be on the front cover of, of magazines so I have a lot of rare stuff on them. And when they got in, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the early 2000s, the uh, the AP, the Associated Press, called me to ask, did I have pictures of the group that they could use? Because people always use the wrong pictures because they mm -hmm. split up into two factions and people always use like, you know, when they when they split up into the to the secondary faction, they they'd have the wrong picture. And so I, I did become like, a you know, a, a person who. OK, if you want to know something about the group, this is the guy to go to. Even members of the group will say, well, Jay, you know, you know more about our history chronologically than we do. So at like, one point I was doing um, like PR for those guys, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. be because I had so much good information on them. So I am the unofficial minister of information for the group. And, I, and it doesn't tell that, you know, every once in a while somebody will call me, hey, I'm doing something on this person or that person in the group. I'm doing something on the group or, oh, tell me something about the message, because there's a lot of. A lot of mystery surrounding that that record and you know i get calls from you know people who are doing documentaries that want me to speak on um on that in fact i was just on unsung a couple episodes ago they did a special on the dj and mm -hmm. i talked extensively about grandmaster flash and you know things like that so yeah it's that's that's pretty much what um minister of information title comes from mm -hmm. yeah i like unsung a lot are you are you a fan of that show certainly that's the yeah. show that i love exactly <clears throat> yeah very well done in your interview with Dr. Coyon, you mentioned uh, Flash and Charlie Chase having a uh, EU's uh, knock them out Sugar Ray. Um, do you know how they got those Go Go records? Like, what are some other like 
go-go groups or records that you think are important? You know, it's it's funny those records they had they had national um and in some cases international distribution even though they were made right up the street I always say from where we are you know right. in uh, in DC and Maryland um they had national distribution so even though they didn't know what go go was really we didn't we knew it was something different and we just like hip hop there's no name for it there's no cultural things attached to it yet but we know that those records with the roto toms and a certain sound that were on like jam records and jam two records and t-e-d-d records and d-e-t-t -T records you know we knew there's something about these records that's kind of hip-hop affiliated but it's not necessarily hip-hop so other records like pump me up of course right. um which was 1980 people don't credit it as an early rap record but trouble funk again right here from a couple a couple of uh, hours up the road from where we are now they made mm -hmm. one of the you know early rap record uh, will pump me up mm -hmm. and because the breakdowns were so dope in that, you know, everybody had two copies of that. Even today, you know, guys like Cash Money and Jazzy Jeff and all the great DJs, they have routines that include Pump Me Up. Mm -hmm. But Knock Em Out Sugar Ray and Pump Me Up were two of the main ones. And Knock Em Out Sugar Ray is a little more random because Pump Me Up was a hit record that would play on the radio and it was well known. Knock Em Out Sugar Ray was a little underground, um, you know, for the New York guys to pick up on. So even early, probably 84 maybe steady b did i uh, bring the beat back mm -hmm. you know and that had knock them out sugar ray in it but it was a foundational break beat that they were actually using in new york which i thought was a beautiful thing because long before eu made the butt you know many years before you know they were already you know hopping on it onto dc funk up in new york and then you know curtis blow took it a step further being signed to polygram mercury or mercury polygram he actually mm -hmm. put eu on party time and then he put mm -hmm. trouble funk on i'm chilling mm -hmm. and what he told me was that when he went to dc and played capital center he said that he got his butt kicked so bad because you can't come to dc without some kind of go-go influence at that time you couldn't especially right. and he said he got his butt kicked so bad even though he was the headlining act he got his butt kicked so bad by the opening act and he said, I got to, you know, I got to do something with, you know, with this music. And he made quite a few Gogo -go songs. Mm -hmm. um, you're currently working on several documentaries. And I think your first book, The Evolution and De-Evolution of Rap Music, is that correct? Yes. Um. I, yeah, the book is coming, but I'm, I'm much more into my documentaries at this point. Just, just all the reasons we always talked, already talked about with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, documentaries kind of taking precedent over, over rap at the time. What can audiences expect from these projects and like what motivated you to pursue them? I guess we kind of touched on you being a documentary head, but um. sure, sure. Well, I've always loved documentaries. I can remember, you know, everything is on YouTube these days, which is which is beautiful. I can remember as a kid and I think it was 81. There was a piece that 2020 did on rap music. And I remember watching it as a kid and just it blew my mind because I was so much into rap. And again, we didn't know what these groups looked like. You know, you had favorite groups that you had to imagine how they looked until like maybe the greatest rap hits volume two from 1982 or 81, whatever. They finally put the pictures of somebody. You finally saw what Spoonie G looked like. But if you weren't a New Yorker, you didn't know what they looked like. Mm -hmm. So this documentary comes out in 81. I, remember, I never forget. I was at my grandmother's house and it was on 2020. And I didn't know it was going to come on. You know, we back in the day again, before the inter Internet. You know, you had TV guy, but you don't know what they're going to talk about on 2020. And kids don't didn't read TV guy. You might look at the pictures, but eight year old, mm -hmm. nine year old wasn't reading the TV guy. Right. So he's watching TV and you just you hear, you know, these guys come on, you know, the, the, the news people come on. They're going to do a segment on rap. And I was it, mine was just blown. So I've mm -hmm. always loved those kind of things. And I'm an information guy. I love biopics, but I think that do documentaries are much more educational than biopics. So. Or biopics, as some people pronounce it. So mm -hmm. I, um, I, I for for quite a while, I've wanted to do that. Even when I was doing the lessons, I wanted it to be less of me just narrating and more putting the moving pictures in. So I do the Ken Ken Burns effect, where I move in and out. And I just got to a point where I, you know, it came from the somebody should do this thing. I'm a guy. If somebody says somebody should do it, right? A lot of times it never gets done. So if I think mm -hmm. I have the wherewithal to do it, I say, well, I'll do it. You know, somebody should do it. I think I can do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, me and my wife were sitting watching Unsung. It was an Unsung on the Sugar Hill Gang many years ago. And I was saying how much they left out. And she's like, yeah. well, you know the story. You should you should do it. Mm -hmm. And I took her up. on. I was going to do it anyway, but I took her up on it. You yeah. know, I was already going in that direction. But, you know, literally, I took that as a challenge almost like she's right. Why don't you do it if you think you can do better or you think there's more to the story? 
And I had interviewed all these people anyway. So I just started to, uh, you know, I invested in some cameras, did a lot of research. And um, yeah, I, I'm working on a documentary uh, currently on The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Mm -hmm. Everything about that that record, you know, the fact that it was written by Duke Booty, who was a, Ed Fletcher was his, his name. Duke Booty was his hip hop name, so, so mm -hmm. to speak. Rest in mm -hmm. peace to him. He, he passed a couple of years ago. But he wrote that song. He wrote everything on the song except for Melly Mel's last verse. So all that's covered on here. Why the group broke up uh, as you know, the group broke up because of that song. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's discussed. Uh, this ge the genius of Sylvia Robinson and her contribution to the song. What music is the song based on? People say, oh, it's based on a Tom Tom Club. It's based on this. All that is revealed. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who have, you know, uh, long, con long form conversations with Ed Fletcher. He was very private, but, you know, we developed a friendship uh, while he was here and he shared a lot with me and the band members like Keith LeBlanc, who again just passed a month ago. He was a mm -hmm. drummer for Sugar Hill Records. So, yeah, Melly Mel's in it. Uh, Raheem's in it. Scorpio's going to be in it. Um, everybody who had anything to do with that particular recording. I'm also doing some stuff uh, on the Fearless Four and the Crash Crew and groups like that but another one that's close to close to uh to my heart is uh pumpkin mm -hmm. one of the first super producers you know along with larry smith um both super producers but one of the first super producers in hip-hop but just nobody knows what he looks like what records he did what was what was special about him you know the love rap which is a foundational break beat one of the most foundational break beats mm -hmm. love rap by uh spoonie g uh, which was the flip side of the new rap language by Spoonie G and the Treacherous Three. If you heard yeah. the beat, you'd know it because it's on television yeah. commercials. No, I know. And everything. <clears throat> They're both dope, but, dope tracks. Yep. Yeah. So nobody knows what he looked like. So I said, you right. know what? People need to know what he did, who he is, and what he looked like. So those are the main documentaries: the message, Pumpkin, and like I said, the other the other ones that are kind of more in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, I did I did want to mention go back to the go go thing. You were born, raised, and live in Richmond, and I, I've lived in Richmond since like I was like eleven, so coming up on okay. thirty something years now. I was born in Ohio, but we moved here okay, cool, when I was like ten or eleven. Um, <clears throat> how do you balance? And this was more about just kind of balancing or juggling. Like, how do you balance your roles as a writer and narrator and content creator across various platforms, such as Rock the Bells and your website and YouTube? Like, how do you kind of balance or juggle all that? <laughs> not very well all the time. I, I'm not the best. I'm not the best at time management. I'm not. I'm not an organized guy. I'm not the guy that goes and writes down. You know, I don't have a calendar. You know, I, I probably should, but I've never been the guy that. Okay, Tuesday, I have to do this, and you know, this is in my calendar for this day. So you know, um, when I get the urge to uh to do a piece of content, it, everything's more structured with Rock the Bells because I'm working for you know, there's a team of people, there's a social media team that I work with, and we know that. You know, whatever month this month is Black Black Music Month, so we're gonna do these stories for Black Music Month. You know, which is coming in June, and you know, this is Women's Music Month, and we want to run something on this group. You know, or what up, uh, Jaquan? What's your content for this month? So that's more structure. But mm -hmm. my my blog and uh, my personal stuff, you know, um, you can go to YouTube and uh, put in um, Foundation Lessons or Jaquan, and you'll you'll run into that. And then wherever you, you know, Spotify, wherever you look at your uh, or listen to your podcast, you know, just put in Jaquan and the foundation and you'll see it. But um, those is very much just on on feeling like I just might be sitting around and say, you know what? Um, you know, this is a great story. Um, I, I wrote something about it, but I, I think people need to know more. But I could be listening to some music. And I could be listening to something by whoever and say, you know what? This would be a great piece. I tell you what, really, as they say, put a battery in my back. I'm going to go back to it. Is the uh, the documentary on um, on Stacks Records? It was a great documentary. After I watched it, I just was like, I just create a burst of energy where I was like, I need to finish my films. And I got on the mm -hmm. phone and I called up the, the outstanding people that I need to do interviews with for you know for for the main films I'm doing. I start scheduling. Hey, look, we you know we need to get together so we can knock this out. Mm -hmm. And that's for two reasons. Um, ever since COVID, we've been we've been losing so many people. Um, you know, since, since, you know, four years ago with COVID and I guess the age we're at, whatever, but I know in the last month, um, I've, we probably lost personally, like I lost three or four people. One of them being Keith LeBlanc, um, Eric Thorngren, who was an engineer for Sugar Hill Records and he engineered stuff for David Boy, huge engineer. Me and him have been playing phone tag for years, never got a chance to sit down with him. He passed away. So that was a motivator for me to say, OK, we need to knock these things out. But seeing that dog on Stacks documentary, it really I feel like whenever you do 
creatives, whenever we do something, your goal should be to make people feel something. Whether you just want to watch a movie, whatever it is, you should make people feel something. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the Stax documentary, when I, I'm going to watch it again. It's four hours, but I'm going to watch it again before the month is out. Well, mm -hmm. before the next month is out. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that, that made me get on the phone and um, try to tie those loose ends. But yeah, to answer your question, um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a thing. It's it's on feeling. Outside of the Rod Bell stuff, it's it's a thing on feeling. Like I think one of the last lessons I did was about Coogee Raps Men at Work. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be the 35th anniversary of that album was recently uh, the Road to the Riches album. And I was mm -hmm. listening to Men at Work, and I was like, I talked about this before, but this is a pretty dope record. And mm -hmm. I just did a lesson dissecting um, that record. So it's it's very much based on feeling at the time. Yeah, I watched the one on the the previous one on Coogee Rap. I like that a lot because you know. It's, it's like you said, I liked him a lot. People have him in high, you know, certain people have him in high regard, you know, in their top five sometimes. It's like, but why is that? Like, you know, I, for me, it's the storytelling, you know, the crime saga kind of stuff. But um, to hear, you know, someone go in more in depth and break it down, you know, I appreciate that. Um, so I'm very interested in the hip hop history of Richmond. What can you tell us about it uh, specifically in regards to the two deaf crew and first sons? That's interesting. Um, yeah, Richmond has, you know, Richmond is a, is a funny place, man, because we're, you know, as my friend Chris Brooks, you know, I love the quote, he always says, we're the, we're the northernmost southern city. And people in Baltimore might have a, a little bit, you know, to they, they might have a gripe with that, but it, we are, we're, we're one of the northernmost southern cities. So we're, we're, we're technically the south, but our influences have always come from everywhere. So growing up, you know, the two live crew was really big here. All of the early electro was big here, but you know, for the first 10 years of recorded rap, you know, New York was everything, but we also got early West coast stuff like, you know, the world-class wrecking crew, which morphed into NWA and Egyptian lover and all that. So as a, as a result, our sound, our sound was New York dominated for it. And I'm talking about just Richmond, not necessarily the seven, five, seven and other parts of Virginia that blew up later, but mm -hmm. our sound was very much, I think the first rap record in Richmond might would debut 84, 85 a group called MCI masters of conversation incorporated mm -hmm. um, a group that uh, the late Eric Stanley produced and shout out to, uh, to my number of the AMC from, uh, from MCI. That group was very influential on me be because they, they had an affiliation to my neighborhood. I think one of them used to date somebody in the neighborhood or whatever. So they would come through with, you know, copies of their record in the trunk and I'm 13 and you know, and a lover of records, as you can see behind me, I've, you know, I've collected records like literally since I was probably, I think I had a record collection at eight years old, little, you know, 45s or superhero records and stuff. So they mm -hmm. come through with their records, um, selling them out of the trunk and you know, it's giving them away in the neighborhood out of the trunk. And that was one of the first groups. Um, and I remember from here that was that organized. There was, there were other groups, of course, I mean, even my group, group, uh, the two deaf crew predated, um, what I know of that group. But as far as putting a record out, they were the first. But from where I sit, my vantage point of Richmond hip hop, I give props to the West End for people all around the city were rapping. You know, ever since the first rap records came out, all of us were flipping the records over, taking the instrumental and, and saying our own rhymes to them. And that's in every city. Every mm -hmm. city. I think you said you were from Ohio. I was in Cleveland recently for um, the 50th anniversary of hip hop. Brother of mine, um, Jay, uh, Jay Smooth, I think, is is his name. Um, he he put out a documentary on the history of Cleveland hip hop, going back to MC Chill and all those guys. So every city could really do their own 50th anniversary because even though it started in the Bronx, by the time I got on record, we all were mimicking that. So we were mimicking that here in Richmond. And um, I remember there was a uh, when you had the the June Jubilee before U Crops, and even that's no longer. But mm -hmm. in the back in the day, the June Jubilee was a very urban event. And I, they used to have it. Um, it wasn't at Browns Island. It was I forgot where they used to have it. But basically, um, I can remember people locking and popping with their, you know, the, the name of their crew on their shirt. It was around the time Planet Rock was out, so it had to be '82. Mm -hmm. And you know, you had so many rap groups. The late August Moon had his own label. Um, you know, he has two labels, Style Records, and then he had um, I forgot the other label that he had. It escapes me. But he had Style Records was one. So he had Honey Bun and Booney, and American Express, and um rockwell and 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 um rockwell and coolie t who was actually disco t from the radio 
And then you have my B box B box on the loose, right? Was B box on, on the loose. And these yeah. records in Japan, you know what they call random rap, you know. And for those that don't know, random rap is basically any rap that you know they probably pressed up five hundred or less. That, this is not the official definition, but anybody that pressed up a couple hundred records and it wasn't, it was independently done and regional and hard to get. They call it random rap. And those records sell for a lot overseas. Like I've seen our record it was a forty-five, our first record. I've seen it sell for six, seven hundred dollars and more. And yeah, it, it made me. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, so basically, so you had that. Um, the first, the after the MCI records, I think August Moon's. Um, it might have been Street Beat. Might have been the name of the label. I, don't, I, I can see the label because the label was actually the skyline of Richmond was the logo for his label, which is super dope. So we represented mm -hmm. Richmond very, very well from the beginning. Was that fun so? Town? No, Fun Town. Um, that's uh, I'm thinking that's Bill McGee's push, label. Push the wave, yeah, yeah. That's Bill McGee's label was, was Fun a Town. Skyline on it, I think, on the label too. Yeah, it does. I think it does. But Fun Town was Bill McGee's label. Bill McGee would go on to you know do the Super Friends stuff, Lonnie B, Mass Skills, and all that before they before any of them blew up. He was recording them, right? Early Super Friends. But so August Moon, his his roster of groups, and he had Freaky D a little later on, and um. Like I said, Disco T, you know, I, I don't want to forget anybody, but as the two deaf crew, us, you know, we were, you know, oh, and you had, uh, oh man, um, Paskey and the Royal Sounds crew from out of uh, West End. And that's what I was saying. The West End was really early with it. I was, I, I'm a Southside Richmonder, but we were bused to the West End in middle school to go to Albert Hill Middle School over on Patterson Avenue. So, I, you know, and my grandmother lived in the West End. So, I, you know, I was always like Meadow Street, Idlewood Avenue. These places, uh, Idlewood was like the home base uh, for Paskey and and their and their and the Royal Sounds crew, and they were throwing their own jams and parties early, the closest to what New York was doing. Um, you know, they were throwing their own jams where they had somebody on the mic rapping over break beats and all that very very early. And yeah, DJ Spaz, DJ Silk, the West End was very strong. With you had MCs all over the city, but for some reason it seemed like they had the the like the proper equipment kind of mm -hmm. before everybody else so when we were still messing around with component sets and putting stuff together the west end was very very to me advanced yeah a lot of crews in north side as well then by the time the breaking movies came out in 84 you know b street breaking all those movies you had break dance contests all over the city um you know it was a very vibrant um a vibrant scene at the time but richmond has always been there um, you know, since the beginning, I remember our group opening up for Just Ice and Heavy D. I still got the posters for some of that. Mm. Doing shows at the Ass Center, doing shows at um, the Show Place on Mechanicsville. We done shows mm. at the Richmond Coliseum. So yeah, our group, the Two Deaf Crew, me and myself, MC Divine, Scratchmaster D, and then we had uh, my, my brother T Wiz J on the drum machine, and the Shockbox, rest in peace, was our um, our human beatbox. And ICJ was also an affiliate of ours. So. Yeah, Southside, very much a Southside thing, but um, we're all, always were there, man. Oh, El Bravador, or did he put out a, a Richmond documentary recently? Yes, yeah, yes, it's, yes. it's been, it, it's or? been, yeah, it's been uh, hip hop legends of Central Virginia, and of course El Bravador and the Z Rock crew, um, who I, I don't know how I failed to mention them. I know he'll kill me for that. Um, El Bravador, DJ MC Fresh. Not people know them from the radio, from WKIE, which WKIE was monumental in Richmond. Not only for Mickey Spencer, the program director, you know, being very uh, willing to let local music play. That's really how our stuff blew up was through WKIE. But um, people know that part of it. But the Z Rock crew was doing, again, West End, you know, again, Idlewood Avenue. That's that's El Bravador. Um, and um, we were label mates. They did a record on Think Tank Records out of Hopewell. And then we did a record um, that same year. Mm -hmm. On think take records out of the web, they pivotal, Ace, pivotal, Ace supreme, right? Ace and supreme, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, they're uh, Z Rock crew pivotal to Richmond. A lot of a lot of guys, they put a lot of people on, and, and then later when Brad did the B side, I think that was the first time Mad Skills was ever televised, was when Brad on oh, El Bravador and um Chris Brooks had the B side. So, yeah, again, I know Brad's gonna kick my butt, and that's one of the docs I'm doing too. I'm helping El Bravador do a documentary on his life story. Mm -hmm. But on, you know, I have to say that our early notoriety, if it wasn't for them putting our record on the way they did, um, right around the time when Public Enemy was between um, Yo Bum Rush the Show and Nation of Millions, when they when they dropped uh, Rebel Without a Pause, 
they used to come down here a lot. They had a good relationship with the Z Rock crew, and they came down here um, back in 86, 80, uh, 87, and El Bravado gave them a copy of our record, and Chuck took it back to New York and played it on WBAU, which is mm -hmm. the college station for Delphi University, where he, you know, where he went to school and where he was on the air. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I have an interview with Chuck D on KIE telling them how our record plays in WBAU and people in New York love it. At the time, I'm 17 years old, and I'm working at Marshall's department store. It's funny because my daughter one time, I told her the story about I used to have to call in sick from work to go do shows. So, you know, imagine I'm in the 10th, 11th grade and I need to go to work the next day, but we got a show open up for Just Ice. So I have to call in sick. Mm -hmm. And people at school, those that know, they know that I'm the one that made this record that's on the radio all the time. But I was a real shy and reserved guy. So a lot of people didn't know. And my, my my daughter said, oh, so that's like Hannah Montana. I didn't know I didn't know who that was at the time. And when I did the research, I was like, it's exactly like it was almost like an alter ego thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, that was a great time in the early days of Richmond and stuff. And then, like I said, later in the 90s, you started having um, all kind of crews, you know, the mad, mad skills and uh, super friends and uh, disorganized union and uh, so many. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of groups start coming, coming mm -hmm. through after that. Did you have that uh, that Richmond in effect? compilation or have you yeah that's i think that's dr mix and i can picture i have I actually have it here they had the skyline of uh richmond on their record too but what was crazy about that again like the do-it-yourself kind of um you know kind, kind of spirit of that the, the record cover some kind of way they, they made a copy of the richmond skyline and they like cut it out and they glued yeah. it to the record yeah, it's yeah. Like a paste so, on mm -hmm. it paste on right yeah, yeah kind of like what um twice i had to sell it i needed the money but <laughs> yeah you know I, i'm I, still I, interested in the stories of, of who's on there because i haven't really heard too much about any anybody that's on that i don't think yeah i'm pretty sure that was dr mix's thing and and, and at some point I'm not sure if that part was covered in El Bravo or his documentary, but he's still tweaking it and working on it and, and, and pending it. So um, hopefully we'll get those stories because there were some interesting records that came out of Richmond. Like I said, Freaky, you know, Freaky D had his his record and um, the brother who was on Ivory's, the Ivory's record label. I can't remember his name. MC Mr. Ruff. Mr. Melody. MC Russ and Obsession. I, I think MC Russ, I think he passed recently, but if he did, rest in peace to him. But so many cats out of Richmond that were just great. And then uh, Mr. Melody, right? Funk Motor. That was Mr. Melody, Funk Motor, Mr. big Mr. record as well, right? Big record, late eighties, early nineties, shoes record, exactly. I was gonna do this if we had time, but it, it sounds like a good time to kind of bring it in. So I, I made a little slideshow of your discography, and figured we could wow. kind of talk, talk through some of this. I've never done this like presentation part before, but hopefully this this works out well. But it sounded mm -hmm. like talking about Two Deaf Crew would be a good time to kind of bring that in. Um, wow. So this this is just a, you know, all pulled from Discogs, but I was lucky enough yeah. to get a copy of the record from oh. uh, my buddy Jason Hamlin, who runs a uh, comic book store um, out of uh, Regency. And uh, hmm. was this like, is this an official like eight, eight and a half by 11 glossy that y'all took or? You know, it, no, it's not. At the time, it wasn't. It is now. <laughs> but It was just a fun we, picture, and you were like, this would look cool if it was a Right. So, so, go back so I, man, I mass copied them and put the logo on there, and, and, and today it's a promotional. But we didn't really have a promotional picture back then. We didn't. What was Think Tank Records? Like, how did they come down and, and put you all in, in Z-Rock career? So, so I'll, I'll tell a short version of the story um, as, brief as briefly as possible. I didn't Based know who- Canada? Who, yeah, I I don't I don't they weren't based in it was based in Hopewell, but you know the record press, press it, them in Canada. Okay. Yeah, you know back then they put you know anything on the label, but it uh, Think Tank was out of out of Hopewell, and what it was, so there was a, there was a guy, Little Walter, is a R and B, is a regional R and B legend here in Richmond, Virginia. You know, had uh, his, his biggest record might have been called a Rope Dope from back in the probably seventies, but you know, funk R and B regional legend, kind of unsung cat. He was on TV one night on cha on cha on uh, WRIC Channel Eight, saying he was looking for talent. And Divine MC Divine, who's actually uh, in this picture, he's as I'm looking at, he's to the far left. He's he's got mm -hmm. a sweat. I don't know what we got on. He's got a sweater on, and we got short sleeves on. I don't know what time of year it was, but he's right. he's got this. And I got to mess with him about having that big sweater on. When we got doing and Scratch Master D has on shorts, so that's crazy. Right. But uh, Divine, he he called he called into the uh, to the to the TV station and said, hey, you know. I'm interested, you know, we got talent here, blah, blah, blah. And Lil Walter came over to Scratchmaster D's house. We did an audition. 
And at the time, you know, again, I was at the time I was 16. I'm, I'm in probably ninth or 10th grade. Always wanted to make a record. Did not care about any if we got money off of it. Didn't sign a piece of paperwork. You can get, you can get us on a record. That's all we wanted. And that's what we got. We got on a record and we got paid for our shows. But when I looked at, you know, later as I had researched the late, the, the industry, I said, oh, wait, I think it's like Dwilly music or something. I can't, I got my glass this close up. I can see better without my glasses, like mm -hmm. Dwilly mm -hmm. publishing and whatever it was. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that means somebody, you know, is publishing here. BMI, you know, this is a, this is a writer's organization. And I wrote those songs. You know, I wrote, mm -hmm. I wrote all of Jay. And then I, you know, I wrote my part of song, Melody Divine wrote his. I'm like, oh, wow, I might be doing some royalties. And then this record, it went to Germany. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I, that picture that you see there, people who have bought the record from wherever they bought it. Hey, I got this record. I didn't know you had a promotional picture. Could you please sign it and send it to Germany? I'll pay for, you know, postage, whatever. So I've sent those pictures around the world. And that record is, you know, it's, it's big in Japan and Germany. It's a worldwide, you know, when I saw itself a 700, I really was like, wow. I remember like using these as frisbees once they weren't literally, once they weren't popular anymore. Just you know, hey, it's over. We 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 didn't we didn't get signed to Def Jam like we wanted, and just tossing them and just throwing throwing the rest of the box away. Mm -hmm. And when I say the rest of the box, you know, maybe ten or fifteen records just didn't matter at the time. Yeah. Um. And like, wow, this could have been six seven hundred dollars a piece on these. But uh, mm -hmm. so Think Tank Records was a, a Think Tank was a studio in um in Hopewell that Lou Walter had a connection with. We went down there, we recorded in the studio. The studio was like in, in, in a bedroom. It was crazy. It was a nice studio. It was in a bedroom. We recorded. A couple of weeks later, we had the record back. It was on WKIE. I'm in the 10th grade signing autographs, um, you know, opening up for Heavy D, Jess Dice, UTFO, Dana Dane. Um, it, it, it was incredible. But yeah, Think Tank Records was basically just, a it was a studio in Hopewell. And they, if you look on Discogs, there are probably seven or other records on Think Tank. The Z Rock crew was one of them. Mm -hmm. And then, like, some funk stuff, maybe some gospel uh, stuff. Yeah, Virginia. The Calvin Ayers, family. Mm -hmm. Was that? Virginia Ayers, I think, is on there. Yeah, yeah. It was, so, it's, uh, Dwayne Calvin and his father, they ran that label. And I don't know much about it other than that. But, like I said, looking back, you know, I, nobody got rich off the record, but it was interesting that it was BMI information on there. And I was the writer. And just as a kid who, you know, I'm not going to say anybody jerked us. I didn't care. And it was in your youthfulness, you can, you know, you're showing the adults you don't care because, you know, you didn't ask about a contract. And you just like, you know, when do we go in the studio? So that's what happened with that. It was a great lesson because after that, I learned everything there was to know about the music business, even before the Internet. So was there a two deaf crew album? No, there was not. There was enough material for one, but and I, I you know, I, I, it's, it's funny because I, I remember telling Lil Walter, I said, "Hey, on the on the on the notes there on the label, can you put from the upcoming album in effect?" Because we always talk. In fact, I'm I am doing a doc on our group called In Effect: The Story of the Two Deaf Crew. Because we will always say, "Yeah, we in effect." You know, popular slang at the time. Mm -hmm. But we were supposed to do an album called In Effect. Because you got to realize by the time we were in ninth grade, um, you know, well, I'm in the ninth grade and the rest of the people in the group are probably in 10th. We're we're writing every day we go home. We're not doing homework. Right. You know, all our grades fail because of hip hop. So our homework is going home and hooking the beat machine up, hooking the sampler up. I'm writing rhymes in school all day. So I have a. a, a I don't have it around, but I have a, a whole uh, thing of tapes. What just stuff we never put out. So there was going to be an album, but there was not. There was not mm -hmm. an album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was curious, like what you did when you were performing or opening up. So you were doing uh, slow and mellow and Jay, and then what, well, yeah, like so, spitting over other people's instrumentals. Or no, no, we always we, had, we either had a drum machine. Some a few times we had a drum ma machine on stage. We had a sequential tom, mm -hmm. which I, I actually have here. We had a mm -hmm. sequential tom, and it's dope because it had it had cartridges with it. They looked like Atari cartridges, and one mm -hmm. of them was an eight hundred eight cartridge. So, you know, you didn't have an 808, but you could plug that in. You could get everything that an 808 had. But so really quick, the stage show, the way that Jay came about, Jay came from the stage show. So we were doing shows before there was a record. That's how we got the record to do to, to do to be able to have have this audition with Little Walter. So we used to do all you know original material. We used to rap over sucker MCs like everybody did at some point. But we had our own drum machine and Scratch Master D would scratch in whatever we, break we wanted to scratch in because we didn't have a sampler. Mm -hmm. And it was a little before the sampling era. Mm -hmm. But our stage show, we admired Run DMC's energy so much that our stage show borrowed from 
their opening routine. So for those that don't know, if you go back and look at Crush Groove or you look at any Run DMC footage, Jam Master J will be on stage scratching his name from the record Jam Master J. And he scratched DMC's name. DMC will come out. Then DMC would say, if you want my, my man Run to come out, say Run. And, and, and the crowd will be going Run. And Jam Master J will be scratching Run, Run, Run. So we love that so much. And I was, you know, that same record, Jam Master J had the vocal piece um, J on it from mm -hmm. Jam Master J. Mm -hmm. So my name was Mike Master J at the time. And we did their routine exactly like that. And Devon would say, if y'all want my boy Jay to come out, say Jay, and Scratch Master D would cut Jay. So that was a routine that we used to do at cookouts, house parties, talent shows. And it always got great reception because it's just like Run DMC's routine. We made it ours, but, you know, we did copy their routine. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever said, oh, y'all are biting. It was always mm -hmm. very well received. Mm -hmm. So when it was time for us to make a record, we didn't know what we wanted to put on record. I think we did Jay as as uh, we did a piece of Jay as the audition for Lil Walter. But it was such a successful uh, 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 kind of party thing and opener that we pressed it onto a record. So when we did shows, we had to do Jay because Jay and Slow and Miller were both playing on the radio, really. And we would go to Skateland and Ashland and wherever we performed at, the Arthur Ashe Center. So we had to do both of those songs because that's what any, anybody knew from us. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of time we had on stage, we we do a, we would do a song called Mike Check. We open with Jay most of the time. We do Mike Check and then we do Slow and Mellow. Nice. Man, this, this turned into a two-deaf crew interview, but I'm definitely uh, excited <laughs> to hear more on the progress of that. Yes. documentary um i have a bunch more questions but i think we're just gonna have time maybe to even get through your your discography here uh can you tell me about the first sons sure um the first sons we became the first sons after the two deaf crew so that 92 you know by the end of the 80s you know everybody's getting afrocentric and you know the malcolm x movie is about to come out people wearing the black medallions you got public enemy poor righteous teachers king son bdp and everybody is getting a little more spiritually awakened and Afrocentric. And we did as well. And we changed our name from the Two Deaf Crew to the First Sons. I changed my name from Mike Master J to Jay Quan. And um, so that's what that was, the coming. The First Sons, we, me and Devon were both, by this time, Scratch Master J had left the group to go join a group called Tech Nine. They were very much gangster rap. So he was doing the total opposite of what we were doing. We were going for the spiritual enlightenment and he was going to gangster rap. So he left the group. We became the first sons because we were both the first sons born of our mothers. And we thought it sounded very urgent, like the last poets and the last Asiatic disciples. So we were the first sons. That's what that was. I thought it was maybe a, a, a brother of yours, like a true like sibling. No, that was that was MC Divine, who changed his name to Divine Mecca. We became so uh, Afrocentric at the, at the time, you know, and not not trying to follow a trend. We really were, you know, we are. You know, like everybody else during that time, we read the autobiography of Malcolm X. There was a wave of, if you, if you remember it, there's a wave of um, this Afrocentric consciousness that was not only permeating hip hop, but permeating like, you know, urban areas in the streets and, you know, definitely the music. So we went through that transformation as well. So yeah, he wasn't my my blood brother, but he he's his mother's first son. I'm, I'm, I'm my mother's first son. And we came up with the first sons. So I played one of the tracks when I was DJing at, um, I forget the name of the the club or bar but it was downtown and i swear the the security guard came up and was like that, that that's me and my brother jay Quan. and i was like really like I just that might have been divine 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 was doing security at one point and if he said my brother jay Quan, i mean he is like a brother to me so i could see mm -hmm. him say my brother jay Quan. that's probably that would have been divine you probably saw divine because he, he he was doing security i should have gotten his autograph right then and there i guess but i was <laughs> like i was like you're jay Quan's brother like I, that's why i was thrown off because i was like okay first son's like figuring oh yeah I, I see what you, yeah no but that, that that's like my brother in fact he's actually I, I talked to him quite a bit uh you know we still have a great friendship and he's actually doing a graphic novel right now and we're working on our documentary but yep that was probably divine yeah the the coming uh ep like the vinyl goes for hundreds of dollars now i saw and then the cassette tape like how how what was your experience like doing first son stuff compared to two deaf crew like did you have more of a following did you feel like you were making traction or you know getting um it, yeah you know it could be frustrating at times um and i'll make this as brief as possible i got plenty of time but i know you don't want to go much over hour it, it could be frustrating because you know when we did the two deaf crew the, the actual record you had professional people doing it you know professional even though the studio was in a bedroom it was professional equipment um 
you know, somebody knew how to master it and things like that. With with the first son stuff, we were doing it was done in a studio and it was a professional studio, but after the studio experience, it was us mm-hmm. doing everything on our own. Um, you know, we're 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 financing it. We're, you know, whatever dis- distribution, this is pre-internet, you know, there's no internet in 92. Right. So it, it could be a little frustrating um because during that time, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of party records that, you know, we felt like these people don't rap better than us. How, you know, how was Doodoo Brown or whatever? How was that such a big record? And, you know, they, they, they can't rap. It's got a good beat. So that part was frustrating. And we always felt like we were a couple steps behind with equipment. So on this on this particular, we recorded this at our Timmy K studio um, over off of uh, the boulevard. Yeah, it was not too far from Mountain Studios um, over there. But so El Bravo actually um, actually engineered some of this stuff. And we we were young. We knew what we were doing. But in some ways, we didn't know what we were doing. But we had a drum machine and we had um, we were sampling, but it was kind of a rudimentary thing. So by 92, Public Enemy is making their second or third record. The records have a lot of bottom. But I never was satisfied with the quality of these records because um we, we didn't have a SP12 or any of that. We're triggering a sampler through the um through the tom, and we just we we're not quite there with the technology. Mm-hmm. Um, th- these are okay records, and they're so, they're highly sought after. But uh, you know, I cringe listening to some of it because we made a lot of amateur mistakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't feel too crunched for time because I think I'm just gonna save any other questions for you know another time maybe. But I, sure. I would like to keep going through the discography if that's okay. Like. I, I got. I'm. I'm open. I'm. I'm. I'm enjoying it. So as long as you want to go, let's keep going. Are you guys both wearing uh, poncho type? Like, <laughs> yeah, we. You know, we got those. New Mexican. You know, you know, at the time they looked a little Afrocentric. We got them from. Um, it might have been Africa House down in the VCU area. Uh-huh, and this. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got some what, tape from Africa House. Yeah, to we used to go there all the time to get incense. Like I said, we were mm-hmm. very, very Afrocentric. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you ever seen the movie CB4, mm-hmm. and you know the guy that's in jail. You know, I'm blackity black, black, black. We were blackity black, black. It was everything Africanness and the motherlandness, and you know, we had the medallions, and it was very much real life for us. So we thought they looked a little Afrocentric. So uh, yeah, we 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 threw them on. Yeah, that's, but we got those from Africa House down down on um down in the VCU area. Yeah, I remember those being popular and yep. around that yep. time. Was, was yep. that first son's t-shirts? I like the logo. Um, no, no, there were no t-shirts. Um, yeah, at the time it wasn't as easy to <laughs> you might have still had dirt shirt. If you remember dirt shirt, that might have still been a Richmond. But you know, again, this is 96, so the internet is there, but it's the very rudimentary parts of the internet. So today, if you want any, if you want a logo, like you know, my logo is on my hat, it's on my shirt, and you know, if you get them in bulk, it don't cost a lot of money. You know, you can you can you can do it. You can finance that with your nine to five money. Right. Ninety six. You know, I was what twenty six years old. My, my 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 first child was being born. I'm very much a young person with a job. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't and people independent artists aren't really that don't have management because we were managing ourselves. Mm-hmm. You, you're not really getting your logo on a shirt. You know, today we would have definitely had first son's t-shirts. My my friend Wes Wes Jones, who went, Wesley Jones went to school with me, he hand drew that first son's logo. I told him what I wanted, and he drew that. And I, I always thought it was a good logo. Today you can have it on a coffee cup or anything, but just back then we were we we weren't quite there. But yeah, that's boom boom. We we sampled up uh, Patrice Russian on that, and so it's so ironic that you would show me that today because. I was in my storage unit earlier trying to get rid of some records because uh, I got way too many. And I came across a letter from Baby Fingers Productions, which was her uh, her production company. We had written them to say we want to sample um, You Remind Me for this song, Boom Boom. And they actually wrote us back and said, OK, if this is only for college airplay and it's not commercially available, we grant you a temporary usage. But if you record, if you get a you know contract or whatever, you have to come back. And so it's pretty cool, you know, because I, I keep everything. I'm a my yeah. wife calls me a hoarder. But, mm-hmm. you know, anything historically, you know, in fact, I'm going to scan that and put it on Facebook today. It was a letter from Patrice Russian's uh, company letting us use. Uh, you remind me. Pretty cool. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. If- if you do like a two deaf crew first sons double album, I think you know you could do stickers or, or t-shirts with the first sons logo on it. I think that'd be fresh. Yeah, we want we want to digitally uh we want to remaster some of this stuff on vinyl. Um the original slow and mellow and jada we did at home, which we liked a lot better. 
um, we, we want to put that out and maybe have a download card where you can get like extra stuff. We're definitely going to have merch and all that. We got we got plans to roll some of that stuff out because, you know, in Richmond, you know, less people probably care about it in Richmond than they do. Like I said, overseas, man, you know, like for some reason, Helsinki, Finland, places like mm -hmm. that. They, mm -hmm. <laughs> when people saw that I was on Discogs, man, it's just incredible the amount of people who are fans of that music. So it's mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, I like the video of you like performing it at home too before. Oh yeah, that was that was uh, very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think by the neck might have been the first first sons record that I picked up, and I really like that one too. So I wanted to mention that nineteen ninety. That was cool. By that time, you know, after Scratch Master D left, I was doing all the production because I used to, you know, I I could DJ too. I could scratch and sample. You know, I was doing a lot of, you know. Uh, co-production in the first place so once scratch master d left it really wasn't a big deal because i did all the scratching and just i started to produce and then around 97 or so we ran to a guy named ricky carter from jersey and he uh you know he had a uh, what was it, asr 10 at his house and we started working with him because it was a little too much on me to try to write and i was you know doing some of the clerical work of mailing the records i was too much for one person to do so we had him djing and producing and that was a record we did with him and by the neck i think we i know we sampled met the man's vo mm -hmm. uh, voice mm -hmm. only way you hang is by the neck it was very wu-tang like um, right sound yeah, to it i liked it but again mm -hmm. but again you know during that time you know 98 you know mad skills i think has already made his record I, yeah i'm yeah he's already made his record and richmond is blowing up and mm -hmm. all those guys are a little a little ahead of us you know lonnie you know to hang out of lonnie b studio in, in in danger mouth and they had a studio together over off from a Lothian turnpike and i'm looking at you know they got an asr and how they're chopping samples up and at that time i'm really feeling like wow you know i'm feeling like a guy from the drum machine era you know mm -hmm. and it's like mm -hmm. You know, we would put a record out like that, and then I would listen to their their, their Aaliyah remix of uh, you know, are you are you that somebody That's and amazing. the stuff that they were doing. And I'm like, hmm, man, we got a lot of catching up to do and a lot of rethinking of stuff. You know, it was mm -hmm. it was it was a it was a funny time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've never seen this one, the Dimes EP. Oh, that was interesting. We had stopped doing vinyl by that time because the CD player was so popular and our generation of people, you know, everybody's you're driving at this point. So, you know, you're not putting stuff on cassettes anymore. Everybody got a CD player in the car. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Dimes was a I, I this was a good EP. We had a young lady named Renee King, who was a really good singer. She was on a song called Paper Chasing. And Dimes was about, you know, the slang wasn't as popular then. But if you see a woman that's a 10, you call her a dime. We're talking about, you know, Good looking women, but we 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 did it over Boscaz's uh Boscag's lowdown, which is always mm -hmm. one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. I always want to do something to lowdown, mm -hmm. and we did that to lowdown. Then we did a remix where we sampled uh one of Steady B's remixes. So it, it, that was an actual interesting EP. Not a lot of people had that, um, because that, that's like a CDR or something we did, you know, just trying something different. So we was sent that? it out to a bunch of labels, but you couldn't buy that in the store, so not not a lot of people have that. Were the beats on that one ASR ten? ASR 10 beats on it. I think that's yeah, ASR 10. Yeah, not a lot mm -hmm. of chopped up stuff. You know, it was a little, yeah, like I said, we sampled Boss Gag, so it's a little commercial, but you know, not MC Hammer commercial, but it mm -hmm. wasn't again. This is Wu Tang time, you know, mm -hmm. so you still, you know, I, it, our whole time I felt like we were a little behind the eight ball with stuff. You know, mm -hmm. some of that was because we were here in Virginia, we weren't doing a lot of traveling to New York to see, oh, the SP 1200 has this much sampling time. You know, now by that time, El Bravador was doing that because he's with first priority records and he's producing Milk D and these guys. But mm -hmm. he's, you know, we're, we're not having that kind of relationship with him because he's busy doing those things. So mm -hmm. we were always, a, and I talk about that in the document, we were always a little behind the eight ball as far as production. I think it's also how long it takes to put out music then too. It's not like today where you can record and put it out instantly on, you know, social media or, or on the internet. Very it much takes so. a while to actually like get these pressed up with the proper artwork and then to, you know, like you said, market and push. A hundred percent because we're going through rainbow records at the time, which everybody was pressing through rainbow at the time, but we were, you will find that we were, you know, financing this out. You know, I was like, you know, repairing computers and I uh, forgot what divine was doing. We were financing this out of our own pockets. And like you said, having to, you know, get the records, um, everything is through the mail. There's, there's no uploading a track through the, you saying your master tape through the mail to rainbow and it might take two months to get a record back. So you, mm -hmm. you make a great point. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this one, five mics. How, how big was this for you personally, like on a personal level? On a personal level, it was everything. I mean, it, on a personal level, it was incredible. Um, you know, two of my favorite MCs. It was supposed to be Kaz, Melly Mel, and Kumo D. In fact, I have artwork with Kumo D. I had a, I had a cartoon 
this is 2003. So yeah, my, my son is born in this year. So, you know, at this point we can finance things better because we really are grown men at this point, you know, um, mm -hmm. even though it's only five years after the last thing we did, but we, we we're in a better position to finance things. Mm -hmm. So, because of everything I've been doing with the foundation, like when I first, you know, with the foundation lessons in my YouTube stuff, when I first interviewed both Kaz, Melly Mel, Kaz, Mel, and Mo D, when I interviewed those three, I told them all I would like to do this record at some point. And they all agreed that they would do it. Melly Mel said something on the record that Mo D didn't agree with. He didn't think it would, you know, jive well with whatever, you know, he felt like his image was at the time and he backed out. So I stuck with all of this artwork that had Kumo D on it, and he's not on the record. But personally for me, like, you know, especially Melly Mel, that was like, you know, that was like my, my again, my idol. You know, I had this guy's records on my wall as a kid. So the fact that I'm on a record with Melly Mel, that was, yeah, per, that was a, as a personal accomplishment, that was literally everything. Mm -hmm. right. And Maybe. this is before Macklemore's record, you know, so, right. you know, Macklemore goes and makes a record with those three guys. And I'm like, Oh I did God. this before. <laughs> right. Did but, that. you know, and, and I'm like, and I'm like, how did he know? How does he know to get those three guys? And I saw an interview and he said, oh, I was doing this old school feeling record. I wanted to know who I should get on. It. And I called Big Daddy Kane's manager and Kane told me to get those three. I'm like, damn, I got those three on my own. But like, who will care that, you know, this many years later that I did it first. So, right. again, behind the eight ball, always a thing where it's like, uh, even with uh, Slow and Mellow. We for slow and mellow, we had Don't Look Any Further by Dennis Edwards. Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you a real quick story about that. Scratch Master D used to make these tapes where he would blend R and B stuff with with, with drum, you know, with a, with a drum machine. Mm -hmm. So he had our, the, the sequential time drum machine. He was he was mixing Don't Go Any Further, Don't Look Any Further, mm -hmm. and we used to just listen to it, ride around listening to it. And I loved it so much. I said we should make a record out of this. So nobody had sampled Don't Look Any Further at that time. But the, our record took so long to get back from the pressing plant that paid in full drop during that time. This was, yeah, this was 87. Mm -hmm. So literally two weeks um, after paid in full, our record drops with Dennis Edwards. Nobody cares or understands that way. You couldn't have copied it because it was two leads later. So everybody, oh man, y'all y'all copy Rock Kim. I'm like, <laughs> so it, it's, it's always, you know, a couple, couple steps behind for us. Who was uh, Dr. No? Dr. No, that's that's uh, he's a producer from from Virginia. He's actually the cousin of uh, Martinez Kelly, who who, ran, who runs um, Kick Him to the Curb Studio, which is a popular Richmond studio for hip hop and other things. And Dr. No is a great producer and he produced that. Um, yeah, great, great production on that. Well, can you tell us about uh, Urban Legend? This one looks like uh, it's getting uh, a little bit of um, demand as well. Like it seemed like prices for this are kind of creeping up as well. Yeah, which is now that one I didn't throw away. I still got that, you know, it, it's 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 crazy how stuff appreciates. And I finally, you know, after the two death crew thing, I was like, you know what, keep these CDs, even though you know they, they take up space, keep them because you know, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen in another couple of years. So Urban Legend was just an EP that I did. I had five mics on it and some other stuff. I, I produced everything on it except for five mics. Um you obviously photoshopped um <laughs> I think I got on a FUBU top, so that, that's definitely 2003. I was down in Shaco Bottom somewhere uh, mm -hmm. for that picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Urban Legend was interesting. Didn't that whole you know five mics just did, didn't do what I what I thought it would do? I'm like, okay, I got a, a I got Grandmaster Melly Mel and Grandmaster Kaz on the, on the, you know as features. Dope beat by Doctor No. You know this is going this is going to do well. I said do well. I don't mean sell a million copies, but you know at least get critical acclaim. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you know we were. I was a little bit before. Like now, old school hip hop is very much in vogue. Everybody, you know, everybody knows who Grandmaster Kaz is. In two thousand three, they 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 really didn't. They, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have known that he wrote part of Rappers of Light. None of this was you know, none of this was again. <laughs> so sometimes we were a little uh, too far ahead. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we were too far back. On this, I was a little too far ahead. Macklemore was was right on time. So mm -hmm. honestly, I was very disappointed with the lack. I remember I sent it to uh, again. They did well overseas, relatively well. But I sent it to one of the big hip hop websites. They might still be around. I forgot which one it was. And they did a write up on it. And they was like, uh, yeah, you know, Jaquan brings on his mentors for this song, but you know, he's he's not much younger than they are. And I'm like, oh damn, that was pretty. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it didn't get appreciated like I, the vision that I had, like people are going to really, be, you know, their minds will be blown. This guy from Virginia got two of the biggest ever on his record and nobody really cared that much. But which came first, is, the 12 inch or, or the album? What was that? 
which came first, the twelve inch single or the album for the um at the, at the same they, they at the same time because we can really find that stuff now because like I said we we we're adults so yeah and I put Divine Mecca on the remix you know Divine was still down with me so I put him on the remix of Five Mics which was a dope record everybody rapped to a different beat on that remix again something that you know <laughs> I think Drake just did that on one of his back and forth so sometimes we were a little ahead of, ahead of our time ourselves but to answer your question it was simultaneous um the the, the vinyl to that came back. At the same time, so the vinyl was only five mics, and then the only way to get the whole EP was um, through a CD. I was gonna say, I, I wonder if you could get Cool Mo D on a remix version now. Like, I or probably he, could. Or I mean, that I, lyric I, I, is still bugging him, and he won't just he won't just hop on a remix even. It, yeah, you know, Mel can be you know Mel can be really really outspoken. So you know, I'm sure some of the stuff he said probably you know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know too much about this one. Can you, can you talk about this one? Just you know, maybe maybe briefly, Clayton Savage and Jake Wan. Yeah, like, Clayton Savage is a, is a multi instrumentalist, you know, and, and vocalist. He's a singer. Um, he was on. Uh, he sang on some of the Furious Five stuff once the group broke up and they started doing that, that kind of stuff. Never knew he was from Virginia. I forgot how we met. Oh, we met um, through my website. I was interviewing anybody associated with uh, with that group, and I interviewed him about some of his music. And you know, he's he's put out. He had done like the th one of his songs, like the theme song for Video LP, which was a show from VET way back in the day. So, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, he's a multi instrument uh, instrumentalist, incredibly talented guy. And somewhere in our conversations, you know, I told him I still, you know, I still was tinkering around with rap a little bit, you know, being a, being an MC or releasing material as an MC. And he said, "Hey, let's do a project together." So we called ourselves CSJQ for Clayton Savage Jaquan. We put this uh, EP out very heavily auto-tuned it, it is very much a product of the time mm -hmm. um i don't listen to it today because you know auto-tune to me had its place and had a very short shelf life so yeah you know it, it was good for the time but that one it has that stamp that time stamp on it mm -hmm. uh i so saw you you had a guest feature on uh the truth is forever uh joe run bombay I'm very sorry, proud joe, of that joe run bombay and phil most chill um i'll be yeah on phil most chill uh hopefully uh, in a few weeks or later this summer, um, incredible cat, incredible cat, Joe Ron, Joe Ron Bombay. For those that don't know, incredible. I don't even call him a remixer. Like he's like the he's like the reanimator. Like he'll, you know, he makes instrumentals of songs that never existed. But when he makes them, he makes them down to that last hi hat exactly like the original to the point where like LL, you might use his Rock the Bells. You know, there's no instrumental for Rock the Bells. LL might, you know, might have used his, and Biz Markie used one of his instrumentals that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Joe Ron Bombay is just an excellent DJ, and like I see, he's like a re recreator, not just a producer. And then Phil Most Chill is a great MC, and he used to do the he did a column. I, I think it was Rap Sheet, one of those World of Beats. You know, he's a breakbeat enthusiast. You know, he, right. enthusiast. You know, we 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 got a lot of records, but Phil Most Chill, you know, any break you can run it run by him, he'll tell you where the break came from. And you know, he's affiliated with with Oxygen and um, you know, they got a group called the Rampagers. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Phil was a he loved my work. I don't even think he knew I was an MC at one point. When he found out I was an MC, he invited me to get on the truth is forever with him. And the truth is forever is like a remake of a song that Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five had called The Truth mm -hmm. from like 84. And as a re as a we redid it, you know, Joe Ron Run Bombay recreated the beat and it's dope. It's like it's a homage to, to Melly Mel. We you know we quote a, you know a few of his lines, but um it's it's a dope that's that's a dope record. I still listen to that. Proud of that Joe, one. Proud of that. <laughs> Joe Ron posted something about uh like a way to kind of break out in here, like uh I think it was based on I think it was like the stereo panning, like how to get, you know, mm -hmm. kind of have the tracks isolated and like multi-track and, and that stuff. Like I love all that yeah. stuff. So when you were going back to, when you were talking about the, the message documentary, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the, in the music aspect of that. Cause it's always been like, is that a sample? Is it not a sample? Like how yeah, is it? No like, samples. All, like how is that? No, all no samples in like, it. But I tell you, I'll give you a sneak peek that a lot of people don't know. A lot of percussion on that was, was backwards. That's why I sounded so, um, like, you know, right. you know, it's, it's, reverse Dude, booty mm -hmm. flipped the tape he flipped the reel to reel over he flipped it over mm -hmm. backwards and inverted yeah. it so a lot of a lot of the drum sounds are backwards on that and when they were and i'll give you one more snippet off of it and this will be in a trailer that'll be out soon when they um when they were doing that record the, the inspiration for the music you know the sugar hill band when they were formulating it the inspiration for the music they were listening to um, my life in the bush it goes by brian eno which is very trippy 
tripped mm -hmm. out music and they were you know smoking weed and listening to that record so that's why that record is so trans like and trippy because that was their influence so it's backwards drum sounds and uh you know inverted symbols it's very interesting how the message came together yeah i love that i love that beat and uh definitely love hearing like you know song especially hip-hop um because uh i think we sh like there's a whole bunch of like rock shows where they'll like do a deep dive on an album or a song and stuff and i'm just like where's the hip-hop version of this you know like uh kind of like what you were saying when you were first on the internet looking for hip-hop there wasn't much there's plenty you know on on rock you know especially when it comes to um you know documentary type segments or shows or whatever um unsung i, I really like a lot but i feel like it has the same sort of flaw that behind the music kind of did where it was like okay it's always this like then they got popular and rose to fame and then they like you know yeah it's always a down, for some a reason downside, whether, yeah. whether it was drugs alcohol or you know sex drugs and rock and roll that sort of thing so right. it's like but a documentary typically you have you know the ability to have more i feel like breadth and and, and go into like yeah diff different take it different directions than maybe like a tv show where you're kind of limited in that time frame yeah this one is gonna be great oh that's keep that's keeps record wow yeah this is i think the last one i had on the the slideshow and, and probably a good way to kind of wrap it up and you had mentioned keith leblanc before so i wanted to kind of bring it back yeah so wow i i really uh forgot that he had put this out 2022 where'd you find this on Discogs? Was just on, yeah just on discogs like i was just going through like i knew you know you had the two deaf crew stuff and the first time sure stuff. sure, um, sure. And I, and well, that, that's great that's great because i forgot i forgot so the and feel most chill uh, and i knew right. you'd you had mentioned or talked about your uh relationship with keith leblanc and, and like you said he had passed away um what was it last just recently right yeah like a month ago it's, it's mm -hmm. been i think they buried him a month ago maybe to to, to date you know might have been exactly, exactly a month ago but yeah uh keith keith was a good friend of mine um you know again met him through the website you know i'm a probably like one of the foremost the foremost authorities on sugar hill records that you know that label literally changed my life you know um after rappers are like i bought everything on the label to the point where like john travolta's brother joey travolta put a record out on sugar hill and i have it if it had that logo on and i buy it so mm -hmm. i developed a relationship with the band and even even some of the son you know sylvia's sons you know leland and joey you know i've, I've you know talked to an in interview so as part of my research for for, for sugar hill records i was doing a, a doc on the band and keith you know keith is in the band and um you know he's also a part of tag head and you know keith is a world-class drummer he's done stuff with nine inch nails rolling stones i mean he's one one a world-class drummer and you know he knew that i rapped you know i don't really tell a lot of people these days that i'm an MC and what my history of music is they found out on their own still mm -hmm. the kind of the hannah montana thing like you know i don't even think ll knows you know and, you know and i have i've had conversations with him and i never really alluded to it. i don't think he knows you know to the degree that like oh this dude's an MC. i just you know not something i talk about Mm -hmm. So anyway, Keith found out, and um, I love your voice, man. Let's let's do something. But everybody raps. I want to do some spoken words. So he said, "Hey, this is long. This is before the fiftieth um, anniversary. This came out in twenty twenty two, but we've been working on this record for probably ten years." He said, mm -hmm. "I just want you to just say a bunch of names of just different hip hop MCs and DJs over these drums." He said, "You know, you'll be talking, but kind of say say each name rhythmically to my drum track." So it was, you know, for years, he sent the track back and forth. Then you have Skip McDonald, who was also a member of Tag Head and a member of the Sugar Hill Band. He had him play on it and he sent sent it back and forth. So he, he wanted to release it in time enough for the 50th anniversary of hip hop. And, and we did. And he I forgot that he put it on this album. Um, yeah. And it, this was this was as important to me as Five Mics was, because even though I'm not rhyming on it, you know, I'm, I'm doing more of a, a, a speaking thing. Again, this is Sugar Hill alumni. You know, this is the guy who played on Apache. He played on Eighth Wonder. You know, everything after Rapper's Delight, he played the drums on it. You know, um, and he did the drum machines on his on, on the whole Force MDs first album and Itching for a Scratch and Malcolm X No Sellout. That's Keith. You know, mm -hmm. so um, honored to to record with him. Yeah, he was a great drummer and a and a, and a great friend. So yeah, rest in peace to Keith. But um. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty decent song. And if you look for the vi the video, we did a video for it. And if you um if you search YouTube Keith LeBlanc, um give thanks, you know, it's up there. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Well, um, I did have one more thing that kind of ties on to what uh, sure, you were saying. Sure. I know we're going a bit over here, so I appreciate you, you staying you on. Uh you were talking about Sugar Hill Band. Um, 
And one record that I, I heard, I think you talked about it maybe in the interview with uh, Dr. Coyon about, um, I think it was Busy B making cash money. You were saying how they right. played, uh, what was it Funky President? Right. I I actually like their version. <laughs> Not that, not that I don't like Funky President, but like I, I kind of love that, like that uh, funky, like Sugar Hill sort of take on it, you know. And um, I guess I'd be curious to hear a version. And I think you said there's like maybe video of Busy B like rapping over the actual Funky President break, like just to hear it. Right, like, I'll send it to you so, in a different so, so, context, like sure, like have it make an actual release would be great one day. <laughs> the yeah, way it's so supposed to be. Maybe. So basically, the fun the funky president record by James Brown. You know, anybody that doesn't know it by the name, when you hear it, you'll definitely know. Very heavily sampled vocal pieces are heavily sampled, and this rhythmic pieces are heavily sampled too. But that was Busy B's um, signature record. He would really rock the crowd off of that. But because you couldn't sample anything back then, Sylvia Robinson would have the bands replay whatever a funky record was. So there was a record called um, Spoonie G's Back, Spoonie's Back by Spoonie G. It had the exact same backing track because they would do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. But track was hot. They give the exact same track to Busy B and um, Spoonie G or whoever in the, in, on, on the label. So they're label mates with the exact same backing track. So for context, for those watching, when you were talking about me having an interview with Dr. Cologne about... Um, about that, what I was saying was the magic of some of the records that they were trying to recreate. Sometimes as good as the band was, they couldn't really recreate it because you can never play a record exactly as the same one twice. So it sounds more like a, you know, like an interpolation or a reinterpretation, mm -hmm. um, you know, where a sample is exactly the same. And at times where I felt like the Sugar Hill band really nailed it was like, if you listen to Freedom by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, it sounds just like Get Up and Dance by the group Freedom, which was what they were going for. Right. That's the joint by the Funky Four sounds just like Rescue Me by Taste of Honey, which was what they was going for. So it was a, t a couple of times where they nailed those breaks and they really nailed it. And I like uh, I like um, making cash money, too. I like Funky President better. But I'll tell you what, who used that was Biz Markie had a uh, Biz Markie used that. Track. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's an animated video for that track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that. And I and I meant to I meant to ask you when we were talking yesterday. Um, I really like the animated videos that you've done where you've had that with your story. Um, oh, so you've seen like, those? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I know like, if you're gonna yeah. work those in your documentaries at all, but it'd be cool to have that. As, yeah, as, I am gonna have animation. For, you know, animation is a lot easier than reenactments. Um, so and cheaper. So a lot of the, a lot of times when I don't have uh, historical footage, I have animations. And one of the one of the animated stories I did was seeing Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five at King's Dominion, which you know, that that was such a great experience. I, I always wanted to do a piece on it, and I thought having it animated was pretty dope. Yeah, I just like the way that kind of adds to the story and everything. Yes, um, yes. Well, I appreciate you you taking the time and, and staying over. And like I said, I got more questions, so maybe we can get back together someday. But um, whenever you want to do a part two, just let me know. Just want to thank you. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to raid out to somebody on Twitch. And uh, if you have anything else you want to promote or shout out, feel free. And then we'll we'll head on out. No, I, no, I appreciate you having me, man. And I, I appreciate you being well researched. A couple of things I was surprised that you found. So um, yeah, I, I appreciate you being well researched in, uh, you know, in my career as an MC. I had to. And um, talking to the hip hop historian, I got to do my research. <laughs> hey, I, I, pre I appreciate it, man. So if you, um, yeah, if you, anybody wants to see it in my writings, you can go to rodthebells.com and um, I have several interviews, stories, um, opinion pieces there. And um, I also write for you, I've written for Universal Music and uh, Rolling Stone. And, um, you know, all, all social media, all social media, I'm J A Y Q U A N, J Quan dot hip, hip hop historian at uh on instagram and just j-a-y-q-u-a-n on facebook cool well thanks again joe kwan i appreciate it y'all have a and thanks to everybody that listened in and checked in on the chat i appreciate it have thanks for day. having me appreciate it all right peace peace